Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Prime Time at the BU Library. Prime Time is a collaborative project between the Friends of the BU Library and many offices like International Studies on campus that celebrate learning beyond the classroom through the experiences and accomplishments of faculty, student, and staff. Join us on Tuesday, February 26th, when Joel Ward of Communication Studies presents Authority and Personality, the Dynamics of Dialogue. Next Thursday, February 28th, we'll have Chris Gitt, Sam Mulberry, and Annie Bergman presenting a presentation called Over There, or Reflections of Studying World War I History in Europe. And today, we welcome Emily Strack presenting a presentation of Kuna Matata, the South Africa Way, and her reflections at her time in South Africa. Hello everyone. Oh, that was my phone. <laughs> um, so my name is Emily Strout and this time last year I was in South Africa um, studying at Stellenbosch University which is about a half hour 45 minutes from Cape Town so right along the coast which was beautiful and I studied with the program AIFS um, American Institute of Foreign Studies. I didn't go to Bethel even though they were there at the same time. <laughs> Wonderful program, I'm sure, but I mainly studied um, political science when I was down there, so that was one difference between the Bethel trip and my own studies. So I just want to share with you about South Africa a little. And the first question I want to ask is, what do you think of when you hear Africa? And this isn't rhetorical, like <laughs> shout out some words or something. Simba. What do you think of Simba? Simba. Classic. <laughs> Akuna Matata. Any others? Well, here is what what I have typically heard. Of. They had Catholic guys. Had this was actually what they played us at our initiation inaugural meeting of everyone. The animals that were there. <laughs> And they said, keep in mind, this is what your parents are going to envision when they see your child is in Africa right now. <laughs> so, if you're watching the whole thing, I just wanted to pick that up. It's beautiful, though. <laughs> so, I asked some people around Bethel, um, when you think of Africa, what do you think of? You say hot. It is hot. African animals, head scarves, and no shoes for the traditional. Um, survival living, starving children, necessity driven lifestyle, community oriented, mission organizations. You see those men with the little starving children and please give me money. Um, and weird food, <laughs> which some of these are true, um, but we'll get to that. So this is kind of stereotyping. It is stereotyping but a definition of stereotyping. Stereotype is a thought that may be adopted about specific types of individuals or certain ways of doing things, but, and in bold, that belief may or may not accurate, accurately reflect reality. And that's what we're going to focus on today. And this phenomenon is most common between cultures um, in separated countries. So us thinking about countries not in North America. We can pretty much guess what Canada is going to be like because probably most of us have been there, or even Mexico because it's a lot easier to get to than Africa and Asia and all of that. So, but what is the harm in stereotyping? Well, let's go there. <laughs> it keeps you from trying new things. Um, yes, weird food was one of them on the list, and that was absolutely true. But they were also incredibly delicious. So these are some weird things. I'll describe them. This top one was actually my favorite. It's called Nshima. And that white puffy stuff is actually not mashed potatoes. And that was a letdown when I first saw it because I was really excited to get mashed potatoes. But it's actually a meal, like almost a corn meal, but it's not based off of corn. And you actually have to take off a chunk of it um, and kind of mold it in your hands. And then you use that to pick up the I don't actually know what that green stuff is, but it's incredibly good. <laughs> There's like some peppers in there and what looks like seaweed, which could be legitimate because they're by the ocean. Um, but it's really good and I would have never tried that anywhere else but in South Africa. Um, the steak looking item on your right there is actually impala, which is 
all over in southern Africa. And at the school I went to, they were called the Springbok, which is a close relative of the Impala. It's kind of looking like a deer type thing, if you want a visual. And then here on the bottom left is oxtail, which is actually really good. It tastes kind of like a savory beef, which tastes like roast beef, kind of. But to say that you have oxtail is kind of fun. So it keeps you from trying new things if you don't go into other cultures. Yeah. Keeps you from interactions you would never otherwise <coughs> have. Um, elephants, classic. Giraffes, we did go on safaris. Um, and that was kind of cool because, I mean, a lot of these animals we've seen, even here in Minnesota, but they're in zoos and they're in cages. And to see them in their natural habitat was beyond priceless. Um, Baboons in the top right, they're everywhere, like they're the squirrels of Minnesota. And I actually didn't realize how used to having baboons around me until I came back and I was driving in my hometown and there was kind of a backup. You could tell some animals are crossing in my head. I'm like, oh, it's probably those baboons again. <laughs> and then I see that it's actually just like this little family of ducklings. And then I had to laugh and think, well, that's probably probably more realistic to have ducks in Minnesota than baboons. But they're everywhere. And they just walk all around you. And none of them try to rip my face off, guys. Don't worry. Um, the ostriches. There's actually an ostrich farm. And that is Eve. She's over 100 years old, along with her husband, Adam, that they have there. How precious is that? Yes, it is. Um, and then on our safari, we actually saw cheetahs and jaguars, which is actually really rare because they do not control what animals you can see when you go on these safaris because they are in their natural habitat. So when you do get to see them, they had actually just killed an impala. That's the little white blob on the bottom. Kind of sad, but it's African life. so. Um, but yeah, the interactions you get to have that you would never have in the United States, or especially Minnesota. Keeps you from experiencing other cultures. This was a man who actually never told us his name. Um, on the side of the road, he actually lives the traditional lifestyle of what we would think of as an African life. But he does it for tourist reasons, which is actually kind of sad. Um, he does have home, a home that he can go to and live with his extended family, but he knows that he can better provide for himself if he stays by. This is right near where we had our safari, um, the entrance to it, where you get on the bus and they start taking you around. And he knows that that's where a lot of tourists go. And so by dressing in his traditional garb and showing you his little weapons and crafts that he can make and he sells them, um, he makes a better living off of that than um, everyone else in South Africa. And also rugby, experiencing the rugby games. That was a thrill. I don't know if any of you have seen Invictus. It's based off of all of that. But we think football games are big here, and it's not even close because there's so much heritage and everything within the rugby culture that they have down there. And to experience that, and them all singing their school songs, and they broke out in shoshalos so many times I can't even count it. And it was just the coolest feeling to be a part of that. And they didn't discriminate against you um, by being outsiders, which they can still work because we were the loud Americans. So, But having those experiences was incredible. And um, you're less likely when you travel outside to find out for yourself what these cultures are like. People can tell you all about it. Like, I can tell you all about my experience. but to actually be there is so much more exciting. And so um, I just encourage you to not let others kind of control your perceptions of other cultures and their experiences, not even me, um, but to take advantage of those opportunities as much as you can. So. And it keeps you from being adventurous. Um, I got to do a lot of fun things over there that we don't have here in Minnesota. Um, this was a canopy treetop tour with their incredibly tall trees um, zip lining around from tops to tops and just to be able to see all the different animals that they have in their wildlife was so much fun. Um, I got to do a lion experience walk where I got to walk around. That's Zeraya. She's almost 12 months old 
and her sister, who is a little more antisocial and didn't like us to be around her. But we got to walk with them, play with them, and that was exciting. And that top one is the world's highest bungee jump, which I got to do um, 216 meters, which in U.S. that would be 709 feet. Um, but yeah, it's, to say that you've done these things in other places is beyond <coughs> words that I could ever express to you. So you'll just have to take my word for it. And it can also keep you from experiencing God in the most incredible ways. Um, this is Victoria Falls. At the end of the semester, I got a few weeks where I could travel around on my own, well, not on my own, with other people, but on our own time. And me and six other people traveled up into Zambia and Zimbabwe, and we got to see Victoria Falls and everything that was glorious about that. Um, and the one thing that was different for me, there was really only one other girl on the trip in the AIFS program who was a Christian. And it was a lot of hard times learning how to have my faith on my own because here at Bethel it's like, well, we have chapel three times a week. We have Vespers on Sunday nights. Um, if you're a freshman, you have your ship floors. And there's just so many opportunities around you that you can take advantage of. And when you're in another culture with people you don't know and your parents are in a seven hour time difference, so that was hard, um, it's, it's definitely more difficult to grow your faith, but it happens, so, it happens in a harder way, but it is so much more effective because you can actually have one-on-one -on -one time with God that you started out and... I don't know. My faith just grew so much, and especially seeing his glorious ways that he made the earth. So um, there are just a few pictures that these are special moments when I just, on my own, kind of felt God around me, even though the people around me weren't necessarily Christian or doing Christian things. Um, this is at the top of Victoria Falls on the Zimbabwe side, and it's pouring rain in there, too. <laughs> This was on a sunset cruise on the Zambezi River, which is between Zambia and Zimbabwe. And this was my devotional spot that I found about a month into the trip. And that's just incredible because you don't get devotional spots like that. Usually it's, oh, I'm upstairs in the library corner. And this, I had a little river with rocks and the mountains behind it. Um, you can experience God in so many, so many ways. And to find those little special places where you and God can meet is great. And this is a very typical sunset in Africa, which just blows your mind because there are like seven different colors in that. And I'm pretty sure ours are just blue and then they get black or there could be white or gray because of clouds. I don't even know how those colors actually ended up in the sky, something with the mountains, and I don't know, but to think that that was there every day, you just can't experience that other places, and the joys of traveling. <laughs> so what do I think of when I hear Africa, now that I've spent six months there, um, having the culture, experiencing God in different places? I think of life. I think of song and music, I think of joy and community, um, appreciation for the lifestyle that they have and they don't blame anyone for it. They find themselves so um, touched by God and God filled. It's just saturated with God's love there and the people, even though um, a lot of the churches were different than the Protestant white churches that we go to here. Um, I, it's hard to explain in words, but. So, who, I ask, is deciding how you see other cultures and telling you what it means to live life out to its fullest? And if it's not you, I encourage you to take advantage and do it yourself. And now it's questions about anything. About my time abroad or the culture. Yes. What made you decide on Stellenbosch to study abroad vocations? 
Um, well, I knew I wanted to travel and see other cultures. And I knew that the semester, you could really only do one semester abroad. Um, otherwise, you don't graduate on time. So that was my one semester limit. And I wanted it to be focused in my area of study, um, with, which is political science. And so um, I found a program that I really enjoyed. I loved AIFS. Um, they're very structured, and they've got great reviews. Um, my resident director there was like my African mom. She was great, and I could never have had such a good experience without her not having been there. And so I really enjoyed the program, and then I just looked at, to see what countries they offered. And so uh, well, where would political science be kind of an interesting topic? And in South Africa with apartheid and all that went on there with that, it was very interesting. And my studies were beyond what I could express because I got to study with um, someone who is part of the UN, um, speaking on behalf of South Africa and Nepal now. Um, I had a lot of professors that were part of NGO programs who were working on reconciliation um, with the people. There's professors who are actually are focused in conflict studies, political conflict studies. So it was just a lot more emphasized in my area of interest that was very fun to have. So. Yes. What was the most interesting thing you found from your perspective from political science that kind of surprised you over there? About the culture? Yeah, either the culture or the issues. I, for me, it was South Africa is now being, it's more well developed than a lot of areas, especially in Africa and Southern Africa. Um, the Dutch population, or they call it the Afrikaners they're doing very well for themselves. It's kind of like a little rich community. Like in my school, I felt like I could have been at Bethel because it was very well developed. But if you go right across the mountainside, there's shanty towns and people living in tin. And so it was really interesting to see that division with such a small space in between them. And actually what hit me was every day when I was walking to class, it was all over the town. So I'd have to walk like a quarter mile, half mile to my classes sometimes. But while I'm walking, there's always these cleanup crews going around, and it's all these adult men who could be my parents or even my grandparents. And their full-time job is to sweep out the leaves out of the gutters or sweep off the sidewalk that I'm walking on just because, I don't know. And I would always walk by them and think, what is so different about where they are from compared to where I am from? that made this their full-time job. And I'm privileged enough to be coming here as a tourist, and I'm studying what I want to study and going into potentially what I want to, because I have the opportunities. Um, so I don't know. Walking by all of those workers and seeing their lifestyle in comparison to what mine could be, just because we were born in different countries, that was kind of interesting for me as a political science student. So. One of the things I think about when I think of South Africa is the AIDS problem there. Did you uh, study that at all, or did you have any observation? About the AIDS, about AIDS specifically? Africa, yeah. There was one course that was offered in the mainstream courses. Um, I didn't really mention this. At my school, it's very well known for its abroad program. And they had certain classes that were offered as like their international program. So they were offered in English. There was a mainstream course, which would have been taught in African honors, um, that was about HIV and AIDS. Um, there were two people, not from my program, that took that class, and they would share with us sometimes um, just what they had learned, but I was not in the class myself, no. But experience it in day-to-day -day life, it never really came about, which was interesting because <laughs> the one of the things, I was doing a lot of research, my parents said, you should do research before you go. So watching Invictus and all of those and reading books and travel guides. Um, and I remember my mom found some of my printout papers and the top line in one of them was, South Africa is really known for its incredibly high rape rate. And of course she panicked and I was like, oh great, of course you'd see that. <laughs> but being there, I don't know if maybe it was just the town I was in, Stellenbosch being so well developed and kind of a close community almost that I didn't really encounter it all that much. Um, maybe if I had spent more time in 
um, more of the shanty towns or Soweto, which is kind of a village off to the eastern side, I would have experienced more of that. But I didn't really, which is interesting. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering, you know, with all that you study, the culture and learning about the differences there, did that kind of make you learn more about American culture? You know, noticing those differences, like, wow, we really don't do that that way, because we often don't understand that we have a culture and so we're a part of it. Exactly. Um, it did, although I would say more so the American connection would be through Western Europe almost, um, just because especially South Africa, has deep ties to um, Western Europe with the Dutch and how, I don't know if history people, um, the Dutch actually came down and kind of pushed a lot of the native African people northward and those are more of the poor sections in South Africa and that's why the main language Afrikaners, it's actually some of the African dialects but heavily influenced by Dutch. And so there was a lot of comparison between what traditional Africa would be like compared to Western Europe. And I know that America and Western Europe down there are very just connected. They kind of see us as the same just because they're the other, the outside the um, benefited people that God has touched. But yeah, I wouldn't say America specifically was recognized by just Western European nations. So it was interesting to be in that section. So yes. How have you noticed that your experience learning political science in South Africa has changed how you think of some of your course content in your major here now that you've been back for a while? Um, it's interesting because sometimes the topics of African cultures will come up in my classes and they're kind of just briefly mentioned more so, whereas down in South Africa we really delved into them to figure out where the conflict was and where did the conflict start from. And so just in my class the other day we mentioned um, how the U.S. and politics, they always try and stray from using like the words genocide and such. And we like mentioned, well, I had to raise my hand and mention, well, the Rwandan genocide and how we strayed from using the word genocide so that we wouldn't have to intervene. And down there, it was like a month-long topic of the Rwandan genocide and um, how the U.N. stayed out and how they didn't really do a lot. So it was different from that perspective to see how much we don't talk about that stuff, um, even if it's just because we didn't have a lot of interaction in it, but we don't really look into, okay, well, why didn't we have a lot of interaction with it? So, in that sense. Yes? What do you do in your free time, like besides school? <laughs> Free time. The main thing to do is to go to a braai, which is kind of like a barbecue, except for they don't actually have barbecue. It's all just sausage, basically. Um, sausages, Impala sausages, actually. Um, but they're very, if you're not doing homework, which for them is like 5% of the time, if you're not doing homework, you're out in the community with other people, hanging out, having braais. Um, going to local pubs and everything, which I find really interesting because that is also one big difference between yeah. at least down in Stellenbosch in South Africa compared to the U.S. Um, but they only drink because it's like a social thing, like they're out together and they'll have a drink, whereas in America it's like they go out to drink. And so the intentions are really different. And at first I was like, oh, well, everyone goes out, and that made me kind of nervous, especially being a Bethel student. I was like, Oh great, and I'm not with a Christian group, but it was, you know, we go out to socialize and if like they have a drink then they do. Which made it a lot easier for me to be there in that kind of a setting. But it's very be out in the community, making connections, having fun, doing what you love. So that was the whole appreciation of life that I really loved. Everyone walks everywhere and I don't know. It's a lot more time outside in nature and everything, so constantly.
haunted mountains. My friend and I woke up on Saturday and said, we should go climb that mountain that we've been looking at for the past month out of our window. And so we did. And it was a lot of fun, <laughs> even though we got lost <laughs> a few times. <laughs> but yeah, I think just the environment being different kind of inspires you to get out and be in it more. So. <coughs> Thanks for coming everyone.